are reasonably optimistic that this is a um, an efficient approach to it attaching motor and fin and um, you might ask well what's it good for and the answers are um, several uh, marine scientists, government officials, um, a lot of people have equipment in the ocean 24-7 um, that's monitoring um, data. They just call it um, data acquisition and it's, uh, uh, it's, they have devices out there measuring temperature and salinity and pH. Um, they have submarines that explore um, down, uh, that map the ocean floors for a whole lot of different reasons. Um, and this craft is a reasonable approach to those kind of contexts. Um, actually, the craft, I'll sh the version two that I have out there with the barge and that you've seen in the videos is a reasonable um, data acquisition device. And so the, if you put a solar panel onto the barge, it would generate about 25 watts of power. So it's um, in the ballpark for a craft that could stay out 24-7. Um, and it wouldn't be going anywhere fast. It wouldn't be... Um, uh, doing more than just trying to hold a position, um, but it's conceivable that it could do that. And the competing craft for that type of thing um, generate power from wave energy. Um, they have a lot of parts. Uh, they have a top speed of a quarter knot. Um, they run into problems when there isn't enough wave action and um, the boats then just drift with the currents. For example, they couldn't use one of those craft in the Puget Sound. It um, moves too slowly. And my craft is cheap enough um, and I think uh, more mobile than that craft. And um, it's conceivable you could use it in the Puget Sound. Um, it can also actually, on the, the next version after this, the second version I've made on the third version, um, it will, um, I'm going to switch to a motor and electronic speed controller out of an electric bicycle because those motors are censored. They have hall sensors in them um, so they can control the position of the rotor and the stator even at slow speeds. Um, they have the right physical geometry. They're um, flat motors that are wide. And instead of lead and a, a lead inertial mass, I'll have a pack of batteries that are surrounding it. And so the, the power source um, will be internal to the craft. The electronic speed controller will be internal. Um, and because the, the motor is bigger, I had a really hard time finding a small motor which met all of these requirements. But because the motor is bigger, um, the overall craft will be about three feet long. Um, and that craft, uh, how long could it stay down for? Um, at least on the order of a week already, based on a quick guess on the amount of power that I would have in a, an array of batteries. And um, if it's not moving very fast, if it's just going um, a knot or two, um, it could stay down there for uh, weeks, it's possible. Um, and again, a very primitive kind of early stage. Um, so that's um, some of the uses as data acquisition devices, as a fully submersible. Um, the craft can also, um, instead of having the motor um, being oriented vertically like this, um, or the motor can be oriented this way and you get a whale-like action. Um, you can also orient the motor forward and have the inertial mass spinning this way and then the craft is going like this and um, that craft could have very large batteries. Um, here's a video. Uh, halfway through I hide half of the components. It's kind of hard to tell, but the inertial mass is going the opposite direction of the wings and the hull exterior. 
and um, there are some fairly easy ways to make um, spring-loaded connections for the mount of the flukes onto the side of the, the hull where they would deflect passively in a spring-loaded way, much like the tail at the back end. And that's another design um, that could be used for very deep sea uh, exploration. And one of the benefits of the design is that it doesn't have any moving uh, hull penetrations, like a regular boat has a drive shaft that's poking a hole in the hull. And you've got to have a seal around that drive shaft. And the seal should be leaking. If it's not leaking, you have a problem because you have too much friction on your bearing. If it's leaking too much, you have a problem because you've got too much water running in. On submarines right now, they overcome that by flooding the motor with oil. Um, but then your motor is flooded with oil and the efficiency of the electric motor drops off um, considerably when it's flooded with oil. So um, it's conceivable that um, the spinner, as I call it, could be another um, variant that would have even longer uh, battery life than the uh, fish-like swimmer. And the fish-like swimmer, the tow craft, um, another use of it is as a um, tugboat. So you scale it up to be 80 feet long, and you can see down there I've got a graphic of it. And in, then the power for it is coming from a generator that you have on your um, barge that you're hauling, and the fish is like 80 feet long, and it's hauling um, barges to Alaska. And because it has only one moving part, and that part's entirely sealed inside the hull, it's uh, inexpensive to make um, and relatively inexpensive to operate. You still have the generator, which aren't cheap. Um, you price them at about um, $375,000 for a, a generator that can um, produce a comparable, comparable amount of power as a tugboat. Um, um, so thousands of horsepower. Um, but still, 375 is a lot less than the price of a um, whole tugboats, when, which knew um, they're over a million and a half dollars, um, and the maintenance and um, operating costs are very high. And on this one, the cost of the fish would be lower. It's a much simpler design. and. Um, that you would still need a couple of people to mind the generator, um, but if something goes wrong, you swap out, you have a second generator back there, and you can swap out generators um, relatively quickly uh, compared to trying to change the motor in a whole tugboat. You don't do that, you bring a whole new tugboat out. and. Um, Obviously, um, so there's potential there as a an industrial um, workhorse kind of a craft. The whole hull is moving, so it's not really for people. So it's kind of a um, whatever it is, it's a drone. Um, yeah, so that's my, my uh, fish boat presentation. I've got the second prototype here. Um, we can go out and give it a try in the water. Sometimes it misbehaves a little bit. Um, but we can give it a try. And I've got the two-person uh, fish boot out there. Um, the two-person fish boot um, is kind of tippy because I'm using the same outriggers as I did on the first one. And you have more mass. And I need to stiffen up those outriggers and make them a little wider. Um, and then it'll, be, um, it'll behave a little better. Um, but I'd be happy to go outside and um, show you that stuff as well. Any questions? How would you implement reverse thrust? Um, you go in a circle, basically. Um, there are ways you can change the flexure of the the fluke, and if you could stiffen it up entirely, it would stop producing thrust. If you, if it didn't, it, it only produces thrust because it's flexing. If you were able to get it totally rigid, it would um, produce less thrust and might even stop. But um, basically, you can't. It's um, you're going to go in a circle, and um, 
there are a lot of interesting ways to steer. Um, actually, I have some data which I was just measuring today on the amount of power it takes to steer with the motor. And so you can spin the motor in just one direction and then that causes torque steer in the other direction. Um, and it was about eight watts for 45 degrees. Um, but I, it was hard to measure the power consumption by the motor after it spun up to that four, after it spun up enough to hold the 45 degrees, um, the power use became very um, uh, unsteady for the motor. Um, so anyway, it's, it was on the, the in the area of eight watts to spin it up, and then how much power is required to hold that speed, um, and then to start oscillating at a at a new higher speed. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, so, but it's possible to steer using the motor entirely. Um, you can also change the flexure of the uh, rear fluke um, in some interesting ways um, that would you, that can be used to steer. Um, but uh, going in reverse, um, people tell me, oh, I should get um, pectoral fins at the front end for steering, um, and those could be used to um, as a brake as well. But I don't like parts, so I'm kind of I, <laughs> I have a thing about parts. One of the designs that looked like um, it was a, like a you know, shaped like a torpedo that was oscillating, you know, radially, you mm -hmm. know, like this. Why not just have it kind of go around in a circle? Would you Be get the same kind of efficiencies? Um, no. Um, interestingly enough, the difference, one of the differences between um, swimming like this and um, a propeller is that a propeller, as it's pushing the thrust fluid back, it's rotating this column of water, and that whole column of water is rotating. And you can rot, and all that energy is lost. You have to rotate it, but it's you can, and you can make your propeller less efficient, so it rotates that column more. And um, at a certain point, you're not pushing the water back at all. You're just rotating the, the this tube of water. Um, and for fish, they call it a reverse Carmen Hall. Um, oh, I don't have a handy graphic of it. Um, it's fascinating. There are these counter oscillating eddies that are going downstream away from your the craft. And as they spin down, they continue to draw on the upstream fluid. And so as the, the, um, these downstream eddies continue to spin down, they're continuing to pull on the, the fluid upstream from them. And it sounds funny that that makes the craft go faster, but it makes it easier for the craft to push the thrust fluid. And it's the pushing of the thrust fluid that makes the craft go. So it's odd that the water is, in a sense, pulling. But, and that's making you go faster, but it helps uh, um, scavenge. That's a theory anyway, that, that's scavenging a little bit of energy. Like um, if it circulates, could you have it, if you had it, where it would, would it still rotate the column if you're trying to screw it through the water? Yeah, that's what a propeller is basically doing, is trying to, sc to screw through the water. Things like a screw up. That's right, yep. And the, the fish, in a sense it's screwing, but it's uh, changing direction once every, every phase. So, um, and you wind up with the pattern that has these counter oscillating eddies. They produce kind of a mushroom shape. And as the mushroom shape expands out, it's pulling the up stream thrust fluid down into that mushroom shape. And it's if you if you're on a boat and you just look at the the thrust fluid coming off a propeller, you can see that it's highly chaotic and there's energy being lost versus a fish. It's uh, you get you see videos of it. It's like oh yeah, it's very regular. They're uh, very parsimonious on their power use. So and could you have a torpedo which is just spinning in one direction and that's basically what propellers do now and um, um, yes 
yeah, you can. Um, and they, you know, they wind up with problems relating to the, the penetration in the hull. It sounds trivial, but that's the limiting factor on how deep you can go in your submarine is that uh, hull penetration. And for the super deep ones that go um, down below um, like 750 meters, um, even 500 meters, they flood the motor with uh, oil, and then you're in a world where your motor efficiency is a lot lower because you're you're um, um, trying to push this electric motor through oil all the time. Do you have a solid tail that really looked at like bacteria? I think they call them flagella. Mm -hmm. Their tails could it be more like a, a width? Yeah, right. Um, I haven't done that. Um, it's an interesting thought. Yeah, the the um, flagella, and they exist in an environment with um, a much greater viscosity. The surface um, friction problem for them is a lot more severe. Um, and it's conceivable you could make a kind of an eccentric weight that was spinning around that would do that. But I like this if approach. You like that, if you have the tug on like this, it would just be mm -hmm. more like a whip shape. Yeah, you'd, you'd want your weight um, off center and um, rotating around. It, you can imagine ways that it could. You could have a, a mass, an off-center inertial mass that was cycling around and causing something with a tail to um, describe a circle. Um, yeah, it's a good idea. I don't. Um, I'm partial to this design because the bearings are all symmetric, so it's like there's no um, no asymmetrically loaded bearings. But I'm just wondering if you were just take this and just you could tie it. Up. Rope and him, if it's going through the water and see what it does with the rope, if the rope is doing anything that fades more, mm -hmm. it would give you more push. Just the rope by itself? Just hanging off the end of the thing would be a good Yeah. Because you got the same motion. Yeah. I don't think you need to have a twisting motion. I just think it's. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, at a certain point, yeah, at a certain point, the the rope or the tail, whatever it is, has to um, have a little bite into the water, and it it's got to um, resist the um, the deflection, um, and that's the flexure of the fluke. And right now, the flexure of the fluke is controlled by um, the polyurethane that I made out of a carbon fiber rod down the center of it. And um, I also made it to go in and out of the back of the boat. So to give it more flexure and make it more flexible, I can push the tail out and then the, the tail stem is longer and more Maybe flexible. A surface plane. It's like a wolf heel. It's like a yep. really long, thin tail. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How much work did you put into the fluke design? Uh, not a whole lot, to be honest. Um, um, on you said you tried it both ways, so you tried it this way and like this. Um, you'll see the fish boot is like this, and it goes like a whale, and the fish boat um, is uh, more fish-like. And that was just my own thoughts about the harness. I have this harness that's holding the fish boat. Um, and it was easier to design the harness um, for this kind of orientation rather than this way. Um, on the, the next version of it, um, the motor, um, the electric bicycle wheels have a hollow core so for your quick release rod. And so that will be a, an opening up and through the, the center of the craft. Um, there would be a heat exchange. You could also plug it in to plug in your power. And you can also plug in there to connect to a harness that you're pulling. And then that component is heavy, and it would help stabilize the craft in the water. Um, and so the, the motor and the harness are all pulling down, and then the flotation of the, the hull is pulling up. And then that um, gives it a, a proper um, attitude. Um, and so for my own 
um, reasons. I put the harness um, in a fish-like orientation rather than a whale-like. Though um, a couple weeks ago at the Marine Technology Society meeting, we had the, this prototype in a larger pool swimming around. It was doing actually really well. Um, but part of the time, you'll see it's askew. And part of the time, it got so askew that it was swimming like a whale and actually doing very well. And the harness was staying out of the way of it. So it was kind of like, mm, maybe whale-like is fine. Um, but, um, Does it make a difference how deep you go? Yeah, um, for the whale-like propulsion, you really want the craft very far down in the water. Um, for the fish-like propulsion, you can be closer to the surface uh, because you are... Um, you're going forward because of, of the thrust fluid you're pushing back. And if you're at the surface and you're going this way, half of your tail cycle isn't getting any water. And so you're, you're losing half your um, propulsive force when you get close to the surface in a whale-like um, motion. On a fish-like motion, they have that problem as well because as you get close to the surface, your, whale, your tail starts to stick out of the water. But until it actually sticks out of the water, you're still um, a little better off. Um, it, it's better either way the deeper the craft is. But this would be, you mentioned you had a barge, and would be capable to the barge, we could have talked about maybe solar, but then you did a battery. This is the one with the self-contained batteries with ballast just to go on its own and carry instrumentation. Um, the, the, the version with batteries, that's just the, the one I, I've made because um, it's harder for me to do the solar power and to do that component. That's a future version um, that would be solar power, powered. And the battery powered one is, um, um, the solar powered version would have a set of batteries on board and they'd be charged during the day and then they it would use it at night. That, that use is for like, you talked about going to Alaska would be like yeah. carrying cargo and this other going deep would be just research. That's right, yep. And Self-contained electronics. Yeah, that's right. And that, on that one, it wouldn't have a barge with the batteries. The batteries would all be internal to it, and the batteries are that inertial mass. Um, and there, um, the inertial mass that you have on the fish-like one is relatively small. The inertial mass you could have on the spinner version um, could be huge. And so on the spinner version, you could have a very large battery. Just scale up good because you start it small and then you yeah. one that's... Yes, it, um, the, the fish-like version would scale very well. And the um, when I talk to the Marine Technology Society, they're all like, yeah, the physics would get better mm -hmm. for it. The larger it is. Mm -hmm. You could power like a freighter for ocean, ocean crossings. Yeah. Um, and it, it the, the whole hull is moving back and forth. So it's like you don't want to... It wants to be free in the water and have a cable that it's it's pulling on something. But it's like if you were to put one inside of a hull, like if you were to take out a propeller and try to attach one of these things inside the hull, you'd have to give it a way to go back and forth. What if you had to um, go inside and then it was kind of like catamaran or something over it? Yep. Yeah, you could do that. You're separated kind of from your, yeah. your drive system. Yeah, I just don't like parts. That's me. So I'm like, ah, parts. You have, you have two of them, and they're, they're opposing. Yeah, and then it's like, ah, then you got twice as much frontal area. Twice as thrust, too. Yeah. So like that one you talked about. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, postulated that the um, schooling behavior of these would be interesting. That um, you get several of these fish next to each other, doing what fish do. They um, and I can feel it when you, when I'm in the fish boot and ambient waves come along, and you can feel the wave beneath your tail. And if you were next to another fish that's producing a wave, you could the two of you could work together. Um, and in this case, you could coordinate the movement of the fish via the motor. Um, rotation, which is relatively simple. And actually, you can do it acoustically, so the fish could listen to each other. Um, a good enough motor, like the um, electric bicycle motor with the hall sensors, it'll be a lot more quiet than this motor. We'll go out and, and turn this one on, and you'll be able to hear it. Um, 
but um, it's because it's a relatively inexpensive motor. Um, that, like it's top speed, you know, I, I'm not really sure. I, I have good graphs. Let me show you the, my graphs on um, power utilization, but I haven't measured the, the speed. Um, this is one cycle for the second version of the fish. Um, <laughs> this RPMs on, right? Yeah, I, you could. Um, I'd have to get a sensor in there for that. Um, and the hall sensors would do that. Yeah, that'd be one of the things they'd give me. Um, this is showing the um, power off phase where it's braking, actually slowing the um, inertial mass down. In the first version of it, um, Nathan actually measured that on the braking phase, it was producing power and sending it back to the battery, which was a surprise because it's a really inexpensive ESC and um, we didn't necessarily think it would produce any power, um, but it does actually produce some, though it might not be measured there. Um, and then this is the phase where it's supplying power to the motor, um, and in this case, the average power on, um, which is basically from there to over there, um, was 15.54 watts, and the total power um, across both portions of the, the drive phase is only eight watts in this particular view. Um, this was average watts over time. Um, this was, I wanna say, on the order of a 17 minute period, and the average watts was around 25. I think these were errors. That there was a lot of data, and I tried to go through and pick out the, um, you know, where it shows, a thousand amps, you know, it's like, no, there is not a thousand amps flowing through the current. It was just an error in the data. Um, but I think I missed a few. Um, you could see that the average was about 25, though um, this period down here, honestly, it didn't seem to have any difference in bollard pull, um, and the average watts was closer to 15 there, so. Um, this is a page on Strohall number, um, which is how um, scientists measure the efficiency of um, a craft that's undergoing an oscillatory thrust um, transfer like fish. They measure the Strohall number of fish. You can measure the Strohall number of things that aren't oscillating like propellers, but it's a, a more complicated um, job. And the Strohall numbers I'm getting are actually in the same range for fish. And um, some minor things to improve here, but the Hall sensor version of the craft um, will be able to have a circuit that drives itself to optimize the Strohall number, which is a ratio of how far the tail is lashing back and forth how quickly it's going back and forth, and how fast it's going through the water. It's basically those three things. Um, F is the frequency. Um, L is the amplitude of the, it's called the characteristic length, how far it's going from um, peak to peak. And then U is the overall speed through the water. Um, and for fish, the Strohall number is typically 0.2 to 0.4. And my Strohall numbers um, are about 0.16. Um, and oddly, what it means is um, the back end of the tail should be going further. Um, it's interesting. Um, but the next circuit can be, can drive toward optimizing that stroll number. Do you have any problem with me? 